Here we go. So what's your name and what's your role? Okay, well, my name is Fiona Kumari Campbell, and I'm a professor of disability and ableism studies at the University of Dundee. Yeah, Great. that's pretty much it. I have a, a, other involvement in bits and pieces, but that's my official title at least. Yeah. Okay, we'll go straight into then. Um, do you think disabled people are is it represented fairly in society? And how is this reflected in broadcast news? Um, I don't, well, hmm, it's a it's a diff, it's a different one. I mean, in the UK, I've only been in the UK for three years, so it's been quite interesting to see um, how how the media works here, and um, it's been actually quite disappointing in some ways because um, I expected with such a large population there would be greater media diversity. Um, you know, I've come from Australia and then Sri Lanka as well, and you know, um, there are different different. Uh, there's different money or lack of money or there's media control but in the UK I expected the uh, media like uh, broadcast media television channels even radio stations um, and social media to be more diverse but I found in fact actually that's not the case and um, there's really a lack of um, quality investigative journalism. That's the thing I've been really surprised. And I know you're recording this, so I, I probably shouldn't say this, but actually it's interesting because um, I'm not really that interested in Australia, but I still have a um, VPN that I use to um, watch lots of Australian documentary um, film stations, you know. And the interesting thing is, I mean, one good thing I can say about Australia is that, um, um, no, there's a channel called SBS, which is a special broadcasting corporation. It's kind of like a minority um, ethnic channel. It's, it's similar to the BBC. Actually, it's probably similar to Channel 4, but it's kind of, um, it's, it's, it's far more diverse and they go into issues in depth. And I think the other issue is that you're getting the, the um, instant access to the marginal voice. So in, in this case, it might be disabled people, it might mm. be other groups. Um, so I find that um, one of the really, there's a couple of issues with um, uh, broadcast representations of disability. One is it's, it's often very surface level um, about what the issues are. Um, I think the other issue is there are only limited tropes or to use a non-technical term, stereotypes around disability that are available. And if you speak outside of those, um, they don't know where to put it. So you've got that kind of... Um, stereotype of what I call the overcomer, someone that some a disabled person who succeeded in spite of their disability and they've almost disavow, disavowing their disability. Like, you know, you would never say that, like, you know, that a black person has succeeded in spite of their blackness. It's, you know, like it, um, it's, well, maybe actually that does happen sometimes, but um, so you've got this kind of like overcomer thing and then you've got this other kind of trope of um, the sufferer. Um, which under COVID now has uh, under COVID now has kind of like transmogrified into the vulnerable. So you're kind of um, you know you're stuck within these things, and there's no kind of in between. You know, like like in my case, I'm shielded. Um, you know, I'm a disabled mm -hmm. person myself, um, and I'm shielded. And yes, there are I'm shielded because there are particular vulnerabilities. You know, but um. But actually, I have lots of competencies as well. And actually, my vulnerabilities aren't necessarily due to my disability in and of itself. It's to do with um, the social context. So I find that there's not that kind of, um, it's almost like a simplicity. Um, and maybe we, you can cover this in some other questions that you're asked. But I think some of those representations actually can be quite, have very, very violent um, and traumatic effects, I think, for disabled people and changing people's cultural attitudes towards disability. Yeah, I think there's also a problem when, as you said, because I've wrote a few things where <clears throat> I have compared it to some like minor ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when people do that, a lot of people get the wrong end of the stick um, when comparing it um, to like other ethnicities um, or other people. Um, I think that's kind of unfair. Yeah, well, it's, look, I think we've got a problem. And, 
you know, I'll try and keep, I, I, I will be provocative but not controversial <laughs> in my answers to you because I don't, because I don't really want any more yeah. hate mail. Like, you know, and this is the other issue about like what kind of freedom do we have to talk about these issues with, because it's actually quite a toxic environment to s discuss these issues um, yeah. in, in, in many ways. I think the problem is, um, is we have the dominance of, I guess, what I call ident identity politics paradigm, and what so we kind of grouped into categories. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's an American scholar by the name of Wendy Brown, and she talks about um, she wrote a paper called Rights. This is not the exact title, but like rights and suffering. And the problem is that minority group model or that identity politics model, it kind of, in order to lay claims to freedom and lay claims to rights, rights you have to prove that you've suffered. I mean, so, and that's a problem in itself because, you know, I might have experienced employment discrimination. Like, you know, it's, yeah. and the, the actions have been proven and they're illegal. Guess what, folks? They're illegal under the Equalities Act. I may not have actually suffered under that. I mean, it's, it's as bizarre as it is, I might have been disadvantaged. But actually, you don't have to prove suffering. You shouldn't have to prove that if something is illegal, you know, that the, the, the laws of the land have decided according to social norms that this, um, you know, discriminating against someone on the basis of disability or some other characteristic is illegal that should be um you know enough of in, in and of itself i think the other issue that you raise about the ethnicity issue is i think where it becomes tricky is the, the categories are problematic anyway because for example like you know disabled people are how do we say it in australia a motley crew we're very heterogeneous we're very diverse um uh not just in terms of our impairments but, but in terms of our lived experiences like it depends on when when you were born now i'm i won't say my age but i'm over 50 and you know i mean so my generation um has experienced disability and how that's impacted upon me and my opportunities, how it's impacted upon myself in terms of um, self-esteem might be different from somebody, you know, who's like 20 years younger. So that's, that's a problem. So we, we don't kind of look at, again, this issue of complexity and the same with ethnicity. I mean, the fact is, even if people are the, 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 the you know, associated with a particular mm -hmm. ethnic group, I mentioned that I'm from a, I'm biracial myself and I'm from a Sri Lankan background. Uh, I mean, Sri Lankans um, have very different perspectives. And again, issues about, you know, where you lived, are you from the diaspora or, you know, what generation are you? Um, so it becomes um, a problem. And the other thing is, uh, um, if I may say, and this is something I'm always banging on about um, uh, because it frustrates me, uh, is that it, this is all in silos. So I'm a member of a number of minority groups, a number of groups that have protected characteristics under the Equalities Act. But yet I kind of, um, I have to choose, like they, they're seen as separate. So we don't really have a look at an inter intersectional approach, yeah. you know. I would love to be a cartoonist, Sanjeev, because I, <laughs> I have these images in my mind and I would love to draw it. John Callahan was, I don't know if you've come across John Callahan's work. He was a quadriplegic animator. Um, have you come across him? No, I have not. Yeah, well, he did. Um, he was a very naughty boy. He um, he he um, actually he did animations most of his life. He's um, he's dead now. But um, um, one of his animations were actually put into a, a, a television program, which was um, I screened in Canada and Australia. It was called Quads. If you look it up on YouTube, and it was down and dirty. Seriously, like he took the Mickey out of um you know disability issues and all that sort of stuff but now why did I raise him oh yes because of the wanting to do a big a cartoonist I mean I have this image in my mind because I'm based at a university as you know and we have these um different staff diversity networks so we've got the BAME staff network and we've got the disabled staff network and we've got the uh, LGBT etc and I have this kind of joke about running between the rooms you know or wheeling between the rooms and like you know praise god that I'm not that the meetings aren't going to be on the same day so we kind of divide people into these kind of quite artificial categories yeah it's not very it's kind of more cross-sectional, I think, than people believe. Like, it could be across four kind of types of people, I suppose. Um, yeah, and, like, and we're affected by our environment. So, like, for example, you know, as somebody who's part of the Sri Lankan community and was, um, even though I'm biracial, I was raised in the Sri Lankan community. I mean, some of the issues, uh, you know, that as a disabled person that I have to contend with, and in fact, I write about this in my research, is we have different concepts of family, 
different ideas around individualism, um, you know, and there's lots of stigma around people who don't fit in or kind of break out the stereotype of what, you know, a Sri Lankan man and woman is meant to be. So yeah. it just complicates things. Yeah, definitely. I think so. Especially, say, like for me also being a member of the BAME community, yeah. um, as well as being disabled, as well as obviously with coronavirus, they're saying that um, obviously I'm vulnerable, quoted vulnerable, um, as well as obviously being more chance of getting the virus. So I think being told that, um, being told you're vulnerable is kind of strange, I feel. Um, yeah, it is. It's kind of like, you know, it's like a king hit, isn't it? Um, you know, um, and yeah, you know, I, years ago I did a paper on this because I don't like the word vulnerable. Actually, mm. I, I feel like vomiting when I hear it. I used to, I'm not as bad as I used to. I, I used to have quite an uh, aversion to it uh, because it's, um, it's tragic. It's, um, it's it's passive mm-hmm. um you know and it doesn't allow you to have agency in any sense that actually we're not vulnerable in uh, all aspects of our lives actually there's some areas we're not it doesn't allow us to play a role and I, i'd rather actually have a view and this is again this is where investigative journalism should be having these conversations about the issue of interdependency that we're all vulnerable in different ways mm-hmm. and one of the great things to come out of the um COVID crisis, um, because it's easy to focus on all the terrible things and the stuff ups. But one of the great things is the rise of mutual aid groups, you know, like I think the community's got jack of government and kind of said, look, we're just going to have to, I think think particularly in Scotland, there's people kind of have been gathering and, you know, checking on their neighbours and, you know, finding ways that people can support each other. So actually, you know, we are, we have moments, everybody has moments of vulnerability. Um, in their lives. Um, For some of us, it's an ongoing issue. I mean, for me, um, you know, I have quite some complex disabilities. I have more than one disability. But in terms of the shielding, the biggest issue for me is a respiratory issue because I've had pneumonia four times. Like, you know, I I mean, it's a real, it is a vulnerability. I'm not going to get into denial um you know i'm shielding with my 19 year old and you know we have conversations like this if if i was to get COVID, it would kill me it would kill me Mm -hmm. simple as that and i've got too much research to do i'm not ready to die you know (laughs) you know i mean i mean i think the other thing is that um from my own perspective um People say I'm morose, but maybe it is my cultural tradition. I'm, I'm from a Buddhist background. This sense that, um, you know, death death is inevitable. Um, uh, but you know, um, it, it, it's so there's a recognition of that. But but it's about you know, there's things we can t- take control of in that situation. You know, and so so there are some vulnerabilities that are definitely there. But I think where it becomes a problem with the media is I think disabled people, and this has come out in the COVID thing, mm. that disabled people, are, I still believe, are being portrayed as burdens. You know, this is a problem. Economic burdens, social burdens. Um, and this came out with the do not resuscitate orders. Mm. Now, I know, I, I know that there has been some changes. <clears throat> but the thing is, you scratch beneath the surface, it's kind of, it's there. We haven't moved. It's. I mean, I've, I've been quite... Um, up front about it it's like a soft eugenics this idea are our lives as valuable um you know just because you have a disability well we're going to put you on a list and say for some reason your life's not worth living or we won't fight as hard for you um i think that's extremely problematic because you know actually we contribute in um in so many ways you know um but there is a yeah i think there there we media could play such a role in changing the cultural conversation do you know what i mean like yeah. like i think it's we're seeing this with the black Lives matters movement um you know i'm trying to be an optimist um you know it would be great if we could get that kind of resurgence of interest not resurgence get get an interest in like disabled lives matters or the phrase from the us not dead yet um to actually to really value disabled people, you know? That could, yeah. it's about a cultural change. Laws can only go, in fact, I was watching a, um, a Zoom meeting 
about two or three hours ago, actually, it's from different Sri Lankans were speaking about kind of uh, nation building. And one of the things is how we, you know, you can you can enact laws. We got them in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, depending on which country, yeah? But you, you've got to have that interior change, that culture change. And I think media um, can play a critical role in that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Um, so if you've had the, the nice guidelines, you probably have um, the frailty scale and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I've done a few pieces for uh, the BBC and the Scotsman, and um, just kind of going into that. And I actually hopefully we're doing a wee uh, broadcast piece on DNRs for BBC as well. So. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's really important. Look, I had a private conversation with someone when I won't mention, but it's a person who's been in the UK. I think they were born in the UK and they've been a disability activist for thirty plus years. And one of the there's a real tension with some of this stuff because both of us are involved in various Facebook groups, you know, around um, uh, COVID and disabled people or people with underlying health conditions. And so, like, there was um two things happening at once one was at, certainly in the early stages was for people to get on you know the disability list we called it you know the shielded list that we now call it that now but and then obviously england had a different system so you could kind of like you know you could kind of sign up online whereas scotland kind of um was very slow in that stage but we wanted to get on the list because most of us wanted to get on the list so we could get access to priority shopping you know at the, with the different supermarkets but at the same time, the DNS thing was happening. And this friend and I were talking about it because in these groups, people were really, really panicking, right? Some of those people happened to be people who were kind of, you know, out about their disability and they'd been involved in the disability movement. But there was a whole bunch of new people. This is the other thing. Who maybe never identified as disabled or had much to do with disabled people, but the COVID things kind of like brought this out, right? So they're still processing their own personal identity and they're in panic they're scared and right brief so but the conversation we had was um there's a tension here about you know we live in an era and i'm sure i don't have to tell you about data matching you know on one hand you want to get on a disability list and you sit there and think shit you know what happens if a, a change of government or a change of policy that they they, they want to look at you know um Who's on this disability list? And, and should we kind of integrate these two lists? And, you know, one thing about um, the work that I've been doing in disability studies, which has been since 2001 now, I used to kind of like have these fantasies I'd put out and say, imagine this terrible thing happening. And I'd, I'd publish about it and say, oh, look, the logical conclusion is this policy, right? Like, so like in the United States, I, I remember saying in 2001, imagine if the government brought in a rule that people who chose to remain disabled, like to refuse medical treatments and stuff, um, whether they would be um, put into a dis different disability category and not covered by anti-discrimination laws. Well, you know, and that was kind of like me just having a bit of it. Maybe I had too many beers, I don't know. But, um, um, but what ended up happening, in fact, there was this category and it was called, it, you'd love it, it was called elective or voluntary disability. These people were put into this kind of category and, you know, they were told, well, you have chosen not to have, you know, um, I don't know, a, a rod in your back or some kind of treatment that's experimented, you know. Um, and, yep, you've got a right, because particularly in the US, you've got freedom of choice. So, yes, you're, you're, you've got the right to remain disabled, but we're not going to cover you by um, anti-discrimination legislation. And so why am I doing a ramble about this is because actually... Um, you know, we would say in the UK, well, they would never do this. They would never have a disability list and then link it in with a kind of a soft eugenics, mm -hmm. do not resuscitate list, yeah? But you know what? We, history has shown us these things happen, you know? And we know this, and I think that... Um, but the discussion I had with this activist was even more interesting. She said to me, um, look, I'm not going to raise that in the group because we don't want to panic people more you know so it's really tough about kind of um being wised up and when you hear about what happens to disabled people you know at the moment um and you know i don't know whether you've been following it and if you haven't you really should there's st great stuff online um uh, the australian government is um running a royal commission into violence against and abuse mm -hmm. against disabled people i don't know whether you, have you seen that 
No, I'm not actually. No. Yeah, no. And it, one thing that's great is that um, I mean, they had a model that was used around the world around um, sexual abuse of children, like I think mm -hmm. two or three years ago, and they went through all the churches and all the sporting clubs, and they're doing the same thing with um, you know, with disability. And um, you know, I mean, it's just um horrific cases of abuse in care homes and you know people saying it's okay for a par parent to mercy kill a child you know <laughs> um and again that's that kind of view that's perpetuated that we you know tolerating disabled people that i think that's what the media presents tolerating right disabled people but actually if if we if we could really do what we want, I mean, this is never uttered publicly, but there is a suggestion that disabled people are burdens. And if we can kind of minimize or eliminate or, or prevent people from being born, um, that would be a humane option. And it's really, really problematic. I mean, you get countries, I think it's like Iceland. I think they've eliminated Down syndrome. At least that's what they're saying, you know, and you like, you kind of think, well, is that great? Is that a good thing? Like, um, it, Down syndrome is part of human diversity. Mm. If we stop, start at Down syndrome, then which group do we go to? You know, so I think the media um, is, is problematic. I mean, on the other hand, I, I have to be nice. Um, I, I, one thing I've noticed, and I have a 19 year old, as I said, is that there seems to be a lot of television shows, what you call it, those kind of, um, oh God, um, Hollyoaks and um, okay. um, what's the one before Channel 4 News that I say I don't watch but I end up getting sucked into. Um, <laughs> it's shocking. It's one of those sitcoms where it's funny, you can watch the last five minutes and you haven't yeah. missed anything each day, you know what I mean? <laughs> but they have like, like I guess the question of representation and of course yeah. you've got um, you know, they've got disabled people just being people, like they're not playing the disabled role. Mm -hmm. I think that um, is uh, more prevalent in the UK in terms of, 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 of media imaging, you know? Um, so I think that's a good thing because uh, actually it's people's exposure to disability that's um, that's really important. Yeah, I agree. You know, and I think the other thing is someone like yourself, I did look you up as well, just like you look oh, me okay. up. So, so I think one of the things is that the big thing I've known, so I've got PhD, right? But I actually started off my my first job was in a sheltered workshop. Um, I don't know if they use that phrase in the UK. Does that yeah, make sense? No, to you? I don't. No. It's okay. So it's like it's oh, it's a sweatshop basically. Oh, it's a okay. Form of abuse. It's basically disabled people who are seen as not capable of open employment. And I got paid fifty cents a day. I don't know what that would be. It'd be like um, um, it'd be less than a pound. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. and my my first job was putting lids on top of bottles and putting knives and forks into air, into plastic bags back in the day when you had mm. real knives and forks and, you know, for airline travel, yeah. right? Um, and that's what most disabled people did. And, in fact, they were really shitty jobs because they were the jobs that um, migrant workers in factories mm. um, refused to do. Um, um, and there was no expectation. There was no expectation of open employment. Um, I was offered a nursing home bed. You call them care homes. Um, I've, yeah, and um, there, there's an assumption. I, I did start university, but the assumption was that I should leave university, yeah, because it was pointless. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1981, right? So, um, but the difference between the two countries is important because, like, less than 3% of disabled people ever go to university mm -hmm. in Australia. It's just horrific, mm -hmm. right? You're at university. Yep. Right, and I have other people, and actually, even though there's problems here, what I found is actually compared to Australia, which is a similar kind of country, right? So, yeah. we're not doing kind of like you know, so called third and fourth worlds, horrible terms, those terms. Uh, we're talking about similar countries, but actually, education um, is more available. I'm not mm -hmm. saying it's easy in the UK, I have to qualify all these things, but I find that there are more educated disabled people. Yeah. And I think that will create a change. It creates a change in our expectations, but also in terms of um, industry and hopefully the media. I don't know how many people are working in the media, Sanjeev, because um, mm -hmm. that's going to be the push, isn't it? If, if we can get disabled people in broadcasting, um, in film production, documentaries, that will change. <laughs> I think as well, like behind the screen, so like making decisions in the background. Yeah. Um, I think that's key as well. I think 
think it's really important, but also being in front of the screen, and correct me if I'm wrong, I can remember when I first came to the country, there was some debate about a woman, I think she was a newsreader or something like that. She had um, uh, um, a incomplete arm and she was going to do a children's program or something like that. And um, there was some carry on, I remember at the time that she would scare the children. And, you know, yeah. I think we've got a long way to, to go. Um, this idea of competency, ideas of beauty, you know, because, it's you know, um, so I think, I think that's a problem. And I would like to see a situation in the UK um, that's been around in the US for like 20 plus years of, of disabled filmmakers, um, you know, doing stuff around disability, but also just, just doing yeah. stuff, you know, <laughs> about anything, you know what I mean? Because I think it's about us controlling um, the images. I think that's where, you know, blogging and now social networking and you mentioned YouTube. I mean, I have a YouTube channel, it's not that active, but I, what it means because we've been locked out of traditional um, access to media as we can potentially, you know, in, introduce our own stuff. I just haven't cottoned onto the thing like the younger generation about how to monetize that stuff mm. because I'm really blown away how people <laughs> can, can, can leave their day jobs and put out these amazing programs, yeah. you know. So, yeah. I, so I, yeah. But I don't know. I mean, the thing you, I mean, you talked about broadcast media. I mean, the other interesting thing, and I don't know whether your your thesis is looking at this, is I mean, it's been very powerful, right? That's where people like, you know, that's why you got your TV licenses and things. You know, uh, that people have used that. But I also know, and again, not from a research base, just anecdotally, is a lot of people are switching off. They they're watching on demand things. They're watching, yeah. you know, paid prescription things, um, and. I'm wondering where they're getting, well, what what kind of representations they're getting from that. I mean, I think there was a thing on TikTok recently about the trashing of people with autism, and you know. Um, yeah, I think you know, um, like YouTube and also Instagram helps. Yeah. Um, like the more influencers, um, just doing everyday things. So, just like people showing that people disabled people can do what anybody else does. So. They can't easily go to uni. Um, the expectations are the same as able-bodied people. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, at the same time, I think there is a role to play like Channel 4 and things like that because, um, I mean, you're a university and, and, and obviously I am in the teaching role. Um, and so we use a lot of these documentaries for our teaching, right? We, there's a site that you subscribe to called Bob. I don't know what it stands for, but... Um, um, so we source these documentaries. So actually, the their the, the, the value is not just from that one one broadcast. Mm. It's you know, mm -hmm. and like um, I can't remember the series, and it's probably not worth me naming them anyway. But there was one like um, it was looking at people who were different, and it was mainly just different kind of disabilities and looking at body image and attitude. And actually, I think all that stuff. Um, is really important to have different mm -hmm. representations. I think where broadcast media, and I, and I mentioned this at the start, is where it falls down is it tends to individualise this. Now, obviously, we live our lives, so we are individuals. But, but for example, why is it that some... And this is always the mystery question, and I'd make millions if I could answer it. Um, why is it that some people succeed, right, against all the odds? Why is it that other people don't yeah and and unfortunately we get this individualization and it comes back to things like you know their motivation or their family support or whatever you know and it's really problematic because then it kind of then pull it kind of hooks into the idea that well you know disability is an attitude so if you had the right positive attitude and that you were um, happy all the time you know and you, you know yourself I mean we spend a lot of our lives trying to keep everybody happy managing people's emotions when they meet us gets bloody exhausting you know um, and I think really what these programs I mean whilst there's some there's some great stories out there I mean I love it I'm, I'm actually a bit of a YouTube addict by the way I'm happy yes to me too I spend most too. of my time watching documentaries you know um, and, and and I learn lots like you know I learn lots and um, um, but the problem is because it gets that individual attribution and of course individual personalities and motivations important it doesn't look at 
the things that shape and form us, right? The broader social context. Mm -hmm. Because actually, you know, I always say for me that education was the key to freedom, right? I said to you, I came from a sheltered workshop mm -hmm. and hey, you know, I'm a professor and, you know, I've kind of made it big time in my area. Uh, it's been a very, very hard road. road. It's been very tough. It's um, um, and maybe I could be kind of, you know, wheeled out as a success story, but it's, um, it, it's not, a, it's not about me. It's about, it's about the structural barriers that, you know, have made things difficult. And I think, um, I think I wish there was more analysis of that because some people, they are so socially deprived, they have had the most horrific experiences, it becomes uh, very difficult to escape that, you know. Yeah. Um, and we have success stories. And, and, and one thing we've learned, I mean, I don't know if this is going to make you depressed or not, but, um, <laughs> you know, we've looked at this, uh, and actually this has been a comparative thing with, like, again, because I come from Australia with in successful Indigenous people, you know. Mm -hmm people who love, look good on posters, gee, I'm an Aboriginal man or woman and I've made it. But actually what's happened at the same time is um, there's really been high suicide rates among those people. And we've, and again, there's been very limited research on this because people don't want to touch it. It's hard to get funding, right? Because it's one of those politically contentious areas. Mm -hmm. There's been very, very successful disabled people, whatever you call that. But, you know, we usually we talk about money, eh? money and jobs, yeah. yeah? maybe, you know, a good partner or whatever, you know, whatever society values. But we've also had, and I said it hasn't been researched, but anecdotally I can say to you, um, I know heaps of disabled people who've been success stories who've mm. actually um, suicided. And I think it's about, we need to look at what's going on. You know, there's a, this is a real issue. Um, you know, and a lot of it to do with the um, accumulative effects of social exclusion. It's harmful. You know, um, it's like the, the cumulative effects of racism can be um, can be really harmful, and we and I think the media can really play a role in exposing that, not just because to embarrass, but to actually give us insight so we can um, you know work towards this not this being different for younger folk like yourself. I put you in the young category, and even younger ones um, that that we learn from history. You know, we learn and. You know about this because disability is is not going to be something that's eliminated it's part of the human fabric you know so yeah you know um but i but i think youtube can be very useful and i can give you you know i can give you one example i won't tell you all the crap that i watch on youtube i do my daughter says to me my god i can't believe you're watching this but like i spent six months ac accidentally looking up stuff on um, north korea or the dprk as it's properly called and you know um and i'm now i'm about to in the next um couple of months or so to start working um on looking at disabled people in north korea so you know these things can kind of open up new doors mm -hmm. um you know but i think in the uk the real portrayal particularly with austerity is this thing of again of what does they call it divide and rule the idea yeah. that um disabled people are rotting benefits um that's a real problem yeah. you know whereas fraud is i mean i'm not into maths but you know of course fraud always occurs but you know it also occurs in big business god forbid we know all these fat cats who've got away with things you know uh, but you know it's um it's a it's it's under one percent and yet everybody is criminalized the idea that we're characterologically suspect yeah and that's a problem you know so it's this yeah. idea that you know um in fact, I did hear somewhere, and it was on a media report, and they said, oh, did you know that disabled people are narcissistic? And I'm thinking, what does that mean? And it's like, we're self-obsessed. And, you know, and you'd love this. The argument is we're self-obsessed because nobody loves us, um, so we have to focus on loving ourselves. Like, this is kind of like weird shit, you know. It's, um, so, what do you do? Yeah. What do you do? So, um, so I think yeah just getting back to that issue i think actually it'd be really great to build some allies with people um in in media whether it be uh investigative reporting mm. documentaries but also film i mean look at silent witness as a classic 
you know. Um, one major disabled character, and I think it's probably, yeah. I mean, I don't know whether there's any research, but, you know, that woman's image and her character in, in that, in that uh, great thriller show um, is being beamed into people's rooms. And I think she has a partner in that in that um, yeah, I think she does. series too, some computer nerd or something like that. But yeah. you know what I mean? Like those kind of things can make such a profound uh, change. But to ask the questions, you know, to find out yeah. what's happening, particularly like with um, with COVID. I mean, you, you said it with the do not resuscitate stuff. Were you, you were being interviewed, were you? Uh, no, I'm going to be doing stuff for it. Right. Um, I'm going to be doing like a package. Right. Um, Top because, you know, that would have been a classic, um, I mean, the lack of interest, so this is the thing, Sanjeev, I mean, the, the lack of interest, I mean, you've got this thing where they want they want to bump off elderly people, bump off disabled people, yes, I'm deliberately using that ridiculous language, mm. but that's what it is, why is this not a shock, why is this not a disgrace? <laughs> Why are we not having a... I mean, maybe we need to have a conversation about this. Like they did in the US, like not with disabled people so much, but with aged people. This is in the 1980s, because, you know, in America, healthcare is very, very expensive. And, you know, there were some very conservative politicians who were saying, hey, you know, these aged people are kind of filling up nursing home beds and they're costing us a fortune. Maybe we need to be brutal about this from an economics point of view. This is what they were arguing. Let me make this clear. This is not what I'm arguing. <laughs> I've had this in the past. It's like, oh, don't know. This is what they're arguing. And they've said, like, it's been a rational economic argument. And there's something in that, I guess, to say maybe we should be, um, you know, removing those people. You know, they're not going to get any better. Some of them are actually semi-conscious, whatever. Um, but at least there was a public conversation about it to some extent. Um, uh, and there's some people, you know, who keep pushing that, those kind of things. You know, there's yeah. um, P Peter Singer, who, um, um, who's at Princeton, I think, or Yale, but another ex-Australian, unfortunately. But, um, but, 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 you know, that would have been a great... Op Why wasn't the media picking up on this? Because actually the nice people... Um, um, you know, I guess I can say this because you're interviewing me. I'm not talking about anyone individually. I mean, they were acting like real sly dogs. If, it was, if that wasn't discovered at the time by yeah. disability activists, that would have gone on without anybody calling those people's decision-making into question. Where was the media? Yeah. They must have known. Feels like sometimes I think you also get put into that bracket when people just think you're doing the whole feel sorry for me when it's, ah, yeah, it's I know, clearly but it's, like it's clearly wrong but then people put you into that bracket as if you're making yeah it. but that's a, but you know but that that's i think that's it's you know it's it's uh, mm -hmm. that's very that's very convenient isn't it because yeah. um actually no this is about um ethics this is about um standing up for what's right you know people often make reference to you know nazi germany why didn't P germans uh complain about what was going on there were signs you know in fact i've just finished reading a book on disability in the holocaust at the moment there were signs people knew with the t4 experiment you know and i think it's like i don't know what it is and you need to look at it in the cultural context of the UK, which is diverse, but this thing about, oh, I don't want to interfere in anyone's business or um, the bystander effect. And I, but I do think the media has a moral responsibility to, to ask mm. questions. Um, and it's not about feeling sorry for people. But, it, and, but, but if it is, then it's about that issue that someone like yourself or myself purely because of our disabilities um, or our impairments, depending on what choice of word people want to use, that we're automatically tragic. They know nothing mm. about us. You know, like, it's um, a really interesting assumption, isn't it? That it's, um, it's tragic, mm. you know? I mean, that's not to say that, that for some of us, there are experiences of, of loss or trying to work out who we are it depends on you know whether you're born with a disability or what stage you acquired um a disability um, um i know that you're associated with the duchene muscular dystrophy. yeah duchene yeah yeah exactly and i mean i've known <laughs> lots of people with duchene over the years and i mean obviously that's something that's a kind of genetic mm. um 
situation but, that, but that's but that's your life and um yeah. and and the other thing is i must say to you um i had the great privilege of um knowing as a friend and as a colleague this is many years ago mm. a, a guy by the name of rob rob mcnamara and um yeah. Yeah, Duchenne, and, and mm. he was the longest surviving man in the world with Duchenne mm. muscular dystrophy yeah. he died in he I think what, what age was it about 48 mate <laughs> and 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 this yeah. is like in the 80s right okay so this is without and 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 he he um he used a respirator, actually used an iron lung because um, he was that generation. But he argues his parents um, uh, always forced him into education. So, again, a different era. Um, yeah. And he, he went to mainstream school and then he... Um, Same as me. He, yeah, and he trained as a psychologist. Back in those days, nobody did that, right? And he ran a psychological practice. And then, you know, obviously as his disability progressed, he then worked part-time. He actually worked for the um, Equal Opportunity Board in... Victoria, Australia, and he married and eventually had a child, right? Mm. But his argument was the reason why he was living was A, he was in love and happy, B, he lived in the community so he was healthier mm. and, you know, and he worked and, you know, I mean, obviously, yeah, sure, the disease is going to get you, right? It's going to get you, but um, at that time, he lived way beyond expectation. But the point was it was the quality of his contribution to his community, yeah. to knowledge, to advocacy. And I don't think that's, I feel sorry. Why is that tragic? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, it's, I just find, so we've, it's about doing work around that at the end of the day. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. I think it's this tolerance thing. Like, actually, we'll include you, but actually, at the end of the day, we actually feel sorry for you. You know, and that's a slippery slope. So what can so, we do? Um, so what can we do to improve? You, you mentioned a few things. How can we get around this? Well, I think, I, I, I tell you what, I think we have to do. I mean, we can get the laws. Yes, we have to be vigilant, make, you know, getting the laws in place, making sure they don't get weakened and because they, they never, it's never any guarantee with laws, right? And, and, and that can make some changes. But I think the big issue is we need to work on changing cultural attitudes. Now, this needs to be done in two ways. And I'm actually just about to, I'm about to write a 2000 word blogging piece on this around COVID okay. and disability consciousness raising. Because actually, I think it has to happen in two ways. One is actually disabled people themselves and their families, particularly the young ones, but even those of us that are a bit older. We need to basically engage in self care. We need to work on our own internalized ableism, our own internalized negative attitudes, because that's a problem. Because actually people, we are witnesses, whether we like it or not. Every person we meet, whether it be for one minute, two minutes, mm -hmm. five minutes, or a couple of hours, will be transformed, right? And I know it's a big burden for us to be the representatives of witnesses, but we are, you know. Um, so that's the first thing. I think we need to, uh, we need to get disabled people exposed to other disabled people to great role models, right? You know, and the problem is like with like things like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, probably, I don't know, were you exposed to other people at a very young age with a um, similar kind of... Me, medication? yeah, I was because yeah. um, I kind of went out my way to kind of exactly. be, be a part of a community and talk to other people. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think that is just so important because we're surrounded by people different from ourselves, which is great. That's what mainstreaming is about. But for people who, for example, have never come across with somebody who resembles themselves or even slightly different and just to see people at different stages. So um, that's really, really important. And it, don't underestimate how powerful that is because that's the internal stuff. And actually, it fits into documentary filmmaking. Mm -hmm. If I can send you a link, I'll send you a link to a documentary that you can't even yeah. get now. It's called The Journey. Um, it's about a, a 72 year old deaf blind man. It is so powerful. I'll tell you why it's powerful because the filmmaker, and I don't think he does disability films, he set it up in a way that you and I, who, who are not deaf blind, can actually kind of imagine what that's like he slowed down the film the sound the pacing the lighting yeah. but there's a beautiful snapshot in that Sanji, which is why i'm mentioning it is of him 75 um holding the hands and showing pictures to a young deaf blind or she was must have yeah. been partially blind at the same pictures to an eight-year-old 
and it was like passing the wisdom from one generation. Mm-hmm. And it was his traveling pictures. He traveled the world. And that stuff is really powerful. So that's with ourselves. I think the, the and that's a, that's, that's a big, big job and it's ongoing. It'll never change because I say new people are becoming disabled all the time and yeah. disabled kids are getting born and all that. But I think the bigger issue is to change cultural attitudes. And I do think that's where documentary filmmaking, uh, fiction, fictionalized, I don't probably not using the right film language here, but you know, like movies, you know, uh, short ser- film series and whatever. I, I think we need to have a range of representations. I think uh, disabled people doing normal things, uh, disabled people doing bad things, Somebody told me there's a new Chinese film about a disabled serial killer. I'm, 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 I'm really sick like that. I like those kind of films. There's one called um, Late Bloomers, which is a Japanese serial killer, but a quadriplegic who goes on a rampage. Um, but you know, we need we need the we need the we we need the mixture of things um, that and but particularly with documentary stuff, it, there needs to be a, a depth. You know, and I don't, how can we do that? I think we need to work with producers. I mean, someone like yourself, like training around some of these issues. I mean, you know, one thing, and this is the problem about being an activist since 1981. I get tired, I get exhausted. I, get, I, I use expletives. How many times do we have to keep going over and over and over, educating the media about the right mm. words? You know, seriously, yeah. this is just, you know, you know, I, it's constantly, you know, um, a problem. But I think the, the, some of the depth things about asking the right questions, I mean, this is a challenge because I think actually in this era of cutbacks to media and the, you know, 24 hour news cycle, actually um, it's very hard. You don't get panorama shows, um, you know, happening everywhere. So I think that there's pressure for, quick stories you know but i think actually they're the kind of stories that can make a difference but i think the other thing as i said to you and i'm not a media studies person so it's more kind of like your your area is i think actually maybe we need to start pulling our heads out and uh, putting stuff on youtube Mm. because actually that's what people are watching you know I don't know what you're feeling about that, like the kind of whole enterprise of independent yeah. production and, you know. Well, there is, there's more and more kind of disabled influencers that I know, and like building up like kind of 40,000 followers. And yeah. um, there's a couple doing, a couple of women actually doing makeup and stuff like that. Right. Um, a couple of them are getting quite big. Uh, but yeah, I think we just need to, so basically I'm trying to hopefully one day sort out the funding. Um, to go to travel um, Europe and uh, access ORV. Um, so I wanted to make a documentary. Yeah, that'd be um, really neat. So stuff that'd like be... that, I think, just going around Europe and... Yeah, and just interviewing know. different people and different... I mean, that'd be neat. I mean, I'm sure there probably could be some really interesting, you know, mm. funding opportunities. I do think, you know, and, and, and this is like there's circles within circles. Unfortunately, a lot of the good stuff I've seen has come out of the US. And I, I look, you know, I might come across as anti-American and I probably am actually, but I think that actually... Um, it's dominated the field and um, actually it dominates the whole social media area. And that's a problem because I think the, the, like the, the, the context of living with a disability or being, you know, a minority in the U S is very different from England yeah. actually. And, and from Scotland, actually living in Scotland as someone who's only been here for three years. Um, and I deliberately chose Scotland, by the way, it wasn't just coming to the UK. Um, I think it's quite different here. I think, um, there is a different, different atmosphere to valuing diversity. That doesn't mean that there are not problems. And we're seeing this with the conversation around race and racism in Scotland to kind of, for people to talk about this stuff. And, and the same with the disability area. I mean, a lot of the kind of big activism actually hasn't come out of Scotland. Mm. I might get slapped for saying that, but you know, I, I don't think it has. I mean, it's it's come from places like Manchester and mm. Birmingham, and you know, where there's been some very wild kind of activism. It's happening in Scotland. Maybe it's in a quieter way, um, you know. And there's organisations like Inclusion Scotland, and you know, I'm involved in the Scottish Autism, um, Scottish Women's Autism Network. I think there's some really great stuff happening in Scotland, but I think it's about. Um, 
uh, you know, using other materials. This is what you're doing so powerful because I think a lot of the stuff we do writing, we do papers, but we don't do the idea of like, um, and I've seen this, you know, give somebody a camera. And of course, nowadays people have got phones to, yeah. uh, to start looking at kind of, you know, individual documentary filmmaking. Yeah. Like, as you say, the travels. Getting, I think actually the other thing that's really powerful, you asked me how, what can we do to change things? I really believe in the power of storytelling or what yeah. we call storying research. Um, and, and it's about providing counter narratives, you know, uh, we yeah. need to control the narrative, you know. Yeah, people yeah. with disabilities need to make their own narrative because exactly. nobody and else more, is going to do the, it. Well, that's right. And the more, the merrier. I think the other thing, as I said, it's a bit toxic at the moment because sometimes we get, this is the problem with identity politics, is sometimes we say, oh, you have to speak about a particular issue this way, you know, and that's politics. It happens everywhere. But actually, we need to have all sorts of expressions of disability experiences, you know. I mean, like you get one of the debates you get, and this comes back to the do not resuscitate, resuscitate debate. You know, is disability something that should be celebrated or something that's tolerated or if we had the chance to eliminate it should we you know and you'll get different disabled people saying different things yeah. um you know and we need to hear all that but also we can hear the contradictions you know i mean i i i don't know i, I disability has shaped and formed me like my cultural background, right? Mm. I don't, I can't separate them out because I don't know what mm. I'd be, right? There's no original person before that, right? Does that mean it doesn't give me the shits? Absolutely. Sorry, I'm an Australian. We're very blunt. <laughs> um, you know, and some days it drives me nuts. I suffer from chronic pain, you know, like, oh my God, like, yeah, mm. it's, uh, it's awful. Uh, but I should be able to talk about joy and despair at the same time, but yeah. I have to... I have to control the narrative and that's what it's about. You know, yeah. we as disabled people controlling the narrative, you know, and some, yeah, and it'd be really powerful for someone like yourself. As so I did look at your photos, are you obviously a wheel, wheelchair user? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm so, yeah. yeah. So I think it's really like just even, you know, it's, it's about firing up the imagination to, to see you go on a road trip. Actually, you don't even need to do anything. <laughs> I should tell you that. <laughs> Go on the road trip and have some breakfast. And, like, like it's ridiculous. Like, for some people, that would be so profound. I remember yeah. seeing, like, again, in the early 1980s, you know, and it was a pre-internet, a friend of mine is, again, also now dead. I've got lots of dead disabled friends. Um, but she had polio, right? She was, she was that generation. But she, I remember seeing a picture of her on an elephant in Nepal. Nobody did that, you know? And and this old 75-year-old deafblind man who, who's also now dead. Uh, I mean, because when people think deaf blindness, they think, oh, my God, this is like double whammy, you know, being blind's bad, being deaf's bad, but, you know, gee, how could you have a quality of life? And actually, he, this guy used to travel to Japan, but he also into Nepal, and he's also on an elephant. Um, and, and we can learn lots because, actually, again, I will send you the link to this documentary because he taught he has no concept of ageing. So you learn about another way of living. Um, his, uh, his idea of travel is about memories because he doesn't hear or see. It's about what he touches, yeah? So this is about a richness of human existence that you and I can share. You know, even as a wheelchair user, our height to the soil, to the yeah. ground, means our experience of moving through life is very different. different. And no doubt, I mean, are you doing much filmmaking yourself? Like, Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing bits, so I've got... Obviously, my documentary, and then yeah, and um, the wee bits. You obviously doing like for, doing it. You did the yeah. debris, yeah, yeah, and then wee I mean, bits you... for the BBC Social. Yeah, the I mean, kind of wee parts. Exactly. I mean, even the very nature of the camera work that you use, it's, yeah, it's such I a imagine experience. would be totally different. Yeah. Well, I need yeah. to for most of my work, it's instructing other people, um, to do everything. So. Like, it's not actually me holding the camera or angling the camera. Right. So, right. obviously, it's a completely different experience. But to... are they doing it at your level or their level? Probably like a mixture. Coming. So, 
yeah, obviously for interviews, it's just their level. But when yeah. it comes to me, like I've got a few B rolls, the like cutaways, yeah. um, just Fine. me driving past, and yeah. the camera like at my wheels. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a lot lower down, obviously, when I'm talking yeah. and stuff like that. So. So it's just about an exposure to, because like, as I said to you, like, I mean, obviously I'm a disabled person, but like when I watched that film, The Journey, uh, I don't know what it's like to be deaf and blind. I, I, actually, I can't imagine it. Um, it's so out there from my own experiences, although I do wear glasses, but that's, you know, neither here nor there. But um, it, it's uh, the power of good documentary filmmaking is, we're not saying that you totally understand, but it's a different way of experiencing mm. so when i meet a deaf blind person now i'm not going to come with all the baggage because you and i have baggage around about mm. other disabilities mm. we, we're not we're not saints you know we have the same baggage the same kind of ableist baggage about disability you know maybe we might be more in touch with that but we've you know you you mm. internalize that so so actually that's again another reason why um you know these kind of um uh, I, I think that's the way we can change attitudes and to get and the technology is there now for I mean it doesn't have to be flash stuff so mm -hmm. I think that would be the changing the attitudes but I think um, but I think pragmatically at the same time it's the stuff that beams in how news reports are done I mean we yeah. I don't I can't envisage a world without a news slot somewhere right mm -hmm. so I think it's about Again, the representations, you know, we need to get away from these, these, these tropes, these stereotypes um, and allow people to tell their story without it being interpreted through the stereotype. Because mm -hmm. one thing we haven't spoken about is you and I could be sitting there saying, you know, great, life's great. And, yeah, I've had these challenges and we're thinking we're controlling the image, you know, and the representation. But the, you know yourself in the process of editing, certain things can be kind of moved. But then there's always often a commentator. It might be the newsreader. It might be a psychologist if it's on one of those reality TV shows who then goes and interprets our voice. You know, they particularly on those reality TV shows, they're the voice of the expert, you know, the Dr. Phil kind of shows, you know. Yeah. Um, so somebody might be thinking this they're, they're telling their truth, they're telling their story, but an expert is mediating that. And that's also the problem with the news. They don't get as long to rave on, but you know, what Jon Snow says on Channel 4, I happen to be quite a fan of Jon Snow and his ties, colourful ties, um, but, you know, how he presents that story is the lens, is the kind of border of representation. So, actually, we need to work with those people. Um, so, yeah, it's probably, that's, I don't know, did you have any other questions? Um. We've kind of we've kind of went through them, I think. Uh, yeah, one more. Okay. That's a problem. I'm a chatterbox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's one more, um, probably yeah. focusing more on the news. Um, what can organisations do to take a step forward? Um, yeah, and does society need to be more um, accessible, at least structurally yeah. more yeah. accessible? So the organisations, are you thinking like disability organisations? Um, more like, like media organisations, so yeah. BBC, ITN, etc. You know, I think they need to engage in training, but not this superficial kind of unconscious bias training. I think that I'm a bit cynical about unconscious bias training because often it's something like it's like a test. You know, you go through it and you get a score and you pass. Does it internally change people? Uh, I'm not yeah. convinced. I'm not convinced about that. In fact, it can be a barrier because actually people think, "Oh, I've done the training. I'm okay," you know. So, um, and and I always proceed from the perspective of what, what I call cultural humility. There is something more that we need to know. It recognises there's lots we don't know, and that's a good standpoint. So, you know, I think the media it would be good to talk to them. For example, how do they? To, I do think we need to not so much training, it's discussions and conversations, right? To talk about, like, how do we talk about, for example, a person with schizophrenia or a mental health condition who attacks people in the streets, who loses the plot, as we say in Australia? You know, how do we do that in a way that we can report the crime, report that people have been stabbed or indeed possibly even murdered without pathologizing all people with mental illness, without sending a message out that if you've got schizophrenia, you're a dangerous person, you know. So I think we need to have conversations about that. 
how do we um there needs to be conversations about the shitty things that happen to disabled people the way we are debased humiliated you know um and and to do that in a way which doesn't kind of um promote a pity i mean i heard a story this morning um and i, I think it was it, it certainly kept kept with me was this idea of um you know, the media and society are not actually giving us rights, right? Actually, we don't need rights to freedom. By virtue of being human, we already have dignity because we're human. That's in the mm -hmm. United Nations Convention of Human Rights. You know, we have freedom. We have inherent dignity. Uh, and we need to know that. And it's, it's about us exercising that, having the capacity to exercise that. You know, um, because uh, if, if the narrative of people giving us things, that's, uh, it sounds like we're asking for special rights and that's a problem. And then you know, people get pissed off because they say, well, how come you people are getting given rights? And then people get really, you know, there's kind of like the politics of envy. Um, so I think conversations, and it would be really good to, um, and because this is not my area of expertise, I, I, I don't know what conversations have happened, had been had in the UK, not just about disability, but the issue of media and social responsibility, you know, because actually um, we know that media can fuel killings. It can fuel racial violence. You know, you only need to look at Fox News in the US mm. with being the mouthpiece of Trump. You know, it's dangerous, uh, but it can foster community. But I don't know whether there's been any conversations. I mean, you're doing a degree uh, in journalism, you said, yeah? I mean, yeah, is, yeah. Is, is the idea of social responsibility something that's central to the yeah. craft, to the profession? Is I that think, something that's emphasised in yeah. your degree? I think... Like the journalists that I obviously know, um, don't like, aren't going out there to push an agenda, but I know there are obviously bigger, higher up editors that do push the, obviously the agenda. Oh, um, but I think we do like we are taught about the ethics, kind of throughout. Um, but yeah, there is obviously newspapers, um, yeah. like the State like the Sun. Um, well, you've got just, the whole you've got the whole tabloid thing. Yeah, I mean, Australia's just, got that, but you know they've fallen on Murdoch Press, you know, um, which is big in Australia. I mean, you raised an issue, and again, it's part of that conversation about like you know, are you meant to be kind of neutral? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and, and and I'm not sure. I, I actually I don't know where I saw it recently. Actually, I think um, I know it was a reporter that was being asked about this. It was in the US, but actually, um, she said, actually, no, we do need to, it was about a connect. No, it wasn't the US, it was Canada. It was a, um, uh, a um, black Canadian journalist and, she's, and she was a senior journalist and she's just recently stepped down from a major network because of institutional racism. And she said, like, you know, I keep reporting these stories every day, and particularly around Black Lives Matter recently. And she says, if I'm a disinterested party, she said, I'm not disinterested in this. And actually said, she said, actually, it is important for us to give a perspective. Actually, everybody has a perspective. The very thing that you, the idea, I mean, I think, to be honest, the whole idea of neutrality is a bit of bull dust. As you say, it's determined by people further up the system, you know, what works. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you do have a position in not having a position. So I think, um, um, you know, the ethics issue needs to be looked at more in terms of are we, are what we are practising, are what we're representing, showing, broadcasting, is it about building communities, about building nation, or is it about dividing people? You know, I think these are really big questions. Otherwise, you know what? And again, you've probably done more on this than me. Um, you know, otherwise you become effectively just a propagandist. Yeah. I mean, that's the bottom line, Very isn't much. it? Like at the end of the day, because actually we know, you see all those old newsreels from the war. Um, what sort of crap are you coming out with? If, it, if it's, um, you know, so, so I think it does kind of raise you know, a really important issue. Um, and in terms of accessibility, I think that comes with values change, you know, because actually, if it, if, if it, the problem that I, we have 
in the UK and in Australia, any law, legal system, anti-discrimination law that's based on a case-by-case -case basis, right? Um, it individualizes what we should be doing. And actually under the Equalities Act, there's a section in it, I mean, this is where it's radical, but they're very quiet about it, is this idea of what they call anticipated reasonable adjustments. And it's about not waiting for a disabled person to come along, it's about organizations, communities saying, what do we need to do to make this environment, the built environment welcoming for all? Um, you know, and again, it's about I guess that kind of no notion of mainstreaming um, accessibility, uh, you will find that a good accessible environment is generally good for everybody. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I'd say even when, kind of, because I went to mainstream school, I think those around me will grow up knowing that it's more, it's just normal, like the people in my class that I went through my school years. We'll, well, that's why I'm saying, like, what, what the, I mean, what a profound impact. And I know that, that my daughter and I have spoken about this. I mean, she's been exposed to disabled people, you know, since the day she was born. And one of her most memorable moments is a guy who's, again, dead. Sorry, I'm talking about lots of dead people. <laughs> anyway, he's a very famous professor, a really zany guy in Berkeley called Paul Longmore. Paul Longmore was a professor of history. Anyway, um, he used a power chair and used a respirator. And one of her earliest memories was dancing with him as a three-year-old. You know, like, it's just, it's the exposure. And, and that's the important thing. So accessibility is really critical, you know, for, for everybody. You know, and it's it's and, and it's about disability. It's also about cultural difference. If you've never met somebody from, you know, a South Asian background or an African background, of course you're going to kind of, you know, build up bizarre ideas about these people. So, actually, I think it's. I mean, have you travelled overseas? Um, yeah, I have. Yeah, I've been to. I went to India when I was six. Right. I mean, one of the greatest, amazing things about, you know, when you're a traveller is you, it blows you away because you suddenly see that people have totally different experiences of life, mm -hmm. don't they? Like stuff that you take for granted, yeah? Yeah, and that's, that's what happened. Thing. When I went it to is. India, I it came is. back like a strange person. Exactly. I was a different person. Exactly. Totally transformative that people have different concepts of time and just just, just um, different senses of smell, um, how people relate to each other. And I think that that's the thing that's at the end of the day um, makes you a better person. It makes you a wise uh, person and hopefully you'll pass on that knowledge to, to other people. So I think and out of that then comes the transformed environment and it's a bit of a chicken and egg isn't it like obviously with your school I don't know whether it was already physically accessible or whether they had to make it that way but um, it's a different school yeah you know um, but you still constantly get problems with some um, people with physical disabilities um, having problems accessing education or someone who totally is dependent on uh, yeah. British sign language for their main you know, mode of communication. Mm -hmm. I, I, it would be bloody hard at the university. I, we, I, I actually asked my people the other day about, you know, did we have many people who were signers? Um, and there's not that many. And I kind of think, well, where are those people going? And, um, you know, yes, it's going to cause some ruptures to the system because people have to do things differently from how they've done it before. But you know what? We'll get over it. Human beings are great adapters. We will adapt. You know, and we'll discover things that we didn't discover, and that's about it. Yeah, I suppose that would be a good way to to finish off. To end it on an optimistic yeah. note, yeah. yeah. And I think the thing is, can I say just one, just one final thing? I think yeah, sometimes sure. as disabled people, we can kind of get overwhelmed by things aren't changing enough or changing quickly enough. And I guess the way I've kind of um thought about this so we don't become angry people because it's very easy for us to become angry or depressed um, is to it, you know change is slow it's incremental and the best we our job is to contribute to social change we don't we don't have to necessarily do big things actually it's the extraordinary acts we do in 
the ordinary things we do, if that makes sense, in the daily things. Because um, And it does change, and it's slow, and maybe we won't necessarily see the results of change. I mean, one of the things about my job that's really great, Sanjeev, is that I will get people who will contact me 10 years down the track and say, hey, you know, you were my teacher and you yeah. said this or you said that and, gee, it's made this impact. And But most of the time people don't give you that feedback, do you know what I mean? Um, mm. It'd be really interesting to talk to your pals back at school to see what impact. That would make a great documentary. That would be great, what, it was it? Like, what it was like going to school with you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe, Uns- okay, uncensored so version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that's been great. great. Thank you for yeah. that. Cheers, thank you very much. You had a really good input, and I think a good amount will probably uh, going into it. And also um, afterwards, uh, I'm planning on releasing probably some of the interviews and um, edited down on YouTube and stuff like that. So yeah, no, let me yeah. know. And as I said, you're like it is other stuff you want to talk about and things. I mean, yeah. the thing is, I mean, this all all this happens through networking. See, like, and um, mm. I mean, uh, um, you know, it, it's it's I mean, you got it through your teacher, you know, mm. and um. I mean, I've never actually met him, and I, I contacted him through. So actually, that was through a Sri Lankan kind of thing. So it's all about networking and yeah. stuff like that, and um, you know. So, um, and that's what what's quite useful. So, um, yeah, definitely. yeah. So you got so you you were due when you when did you say you yeah, were due August the twenty first. And then so that's it, two is months. It? Yeah, that's me. Yeah, so I'm applying for jobs. And then what and, do you hope to do? Yeah. What what are you what are your plans? Well, I'm applying for jobs. Um, I've kind of got a foot in the door at the BBC um, just now doing freelance. So hopefully more towards that direction. But I do, I, want, I just want to make documentaries as well, actually. Like, yeah. like even if and I don't get a job. This Channel 4 happy. model, I, I looked at Channel 4 because I'm intrigued by it, as I said, um, because I looked at their original, um, you know, statutes. And I understand that most of this stuff they, um, they commission out, kind yeah. of. It's not so, they don't seem to do as much... Um, in house, um, yeah, yeah, which is big, which is a shame. Um, I mean, I'd like to get that. I think I can be honest. I've been very disappointed with the BBC because when I was in Australia and Sri Lanka, we used to um, have access to the BBC um, mm. International, yeah. But that's a bit. That's actually higher quality <laughs> than the domestic, mm. you know. And I've been really surprised about how uncritical or biased the BBC is, you know, around a whole range of. Um, issues and i just wish it would um because it's so well funded compared to the, the australian equivalents called the abc um and they've just had massive budget cuts but the bbc here because of the tv licensing system i mean it mm. really could have more um documentaries yeah you know? be really yeah, interesting to do a documentary on the intersection of um being disabled and yeah. um, coming from the indian community so yeah i used to be a writer um I've right. kind of moved over into broadcast. Right. Um, I think right. that would be a really good idea, though, um, the Asian community, because it's still... Well, you know, it'd be good, and I might be able to actually help you out at some stage with some work. It's really early days. I've just been asked to be on the editorial board of the Indian Journal of Disability wow. Studies, right? And it's an online journal. But hopefully, what's happening now with a lot of these online journals is they're now also introduced, like they're academic journals, right? Mm-hmm. But they're introducing like video content. Um, 